All right, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2023 NCAR Earth System Science, or NESI, oral presentations. I'm Jerry Sacconi, and I am the NCAR Student Program Coordinator and Director of NESI. This year, we had eight students uh, participating in the NESI program, five undergrad and three graduate students, representing Boston University, Jackson State University, Pitzer College, the University of Albany SUNY, the University of Arizona, the University of California, Santa Barbara, University of Puerto Rico at Mayaguez, and the University of Texas at El Paso. Also for the first time this summer, Nessie was supported by a graduate assistant, Ben Fellman, from the University of Oklahoma, who participated in the Nessie program last year, um, last summer, and Ben will be presenting today as well. Before we start presentations, I would like to thank our organize, organizational leaders, Tony Busalaki, Everett Joseph, and Bill Quo, also our lab directors, particularly Rebecca Hocker, the Director of Education, Engagement, and Early Career Development, for your support, support of our student programs. Also, thank you to Program Lab and Sys Admins for your tireless work preparing for the arrival of our students. Uh, thank you to Multimedia Services, uh, and uh, multimedia services, excuse me, for all of your help with events this week and throughout the summer. A big thank you to Nessie and Sci Park's mentors and all the mentors across the organization that volunteer their time to help train the next generation of Earth System scientists. Thank you to the Nessie and Sci Parks interns for all of your hard work this summer. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you and getting to know you over the past 10 weeks. And finally, I'd like to thank the Sci Parks leaders, Virginia and Julius, the SOARS leaders, Kadidia and Marisa, Nessie admin, Aliyah, and of course, the Nessie graduate assistant, Ben. I truly value our collaboration in student programming, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do in support of Nessie and all of our student programs. So, uh, without further ado, please welcome to the stage our first presenter, Daniel Bonilla, an undergraduate student from Pitzer College in California, Daniel's presentation is titled, Evolution of Atmospheric Water, uh, Sulfur Dioxide, and Sulfate After 2022 Hunga Tonga, Hunga Ha'a Pai Volcanic Eruption. I really hope I got that right. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Daniel Bonilla, and I just finished my second year at Pitzer College in Claremont, California. Um, and this summer, as an SE intern, I was fortunate enough to work with, to work with and collaborate with Jun Zhang, a postdoc um, through the ACOM or Atmospheric Chemistry Observations and Modeling Lab. Um, and I'm very excited to be here today. Um, the title of my talk or presentation is The Evolution of Atmospheric Sulfur Dioxide water vapor, and sulfate after the 2022 Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha Apai volcanic eruption. It's not working. There we go. OK, so um, kind of with some background information. So um, the Hunga Tonga Hunga Ha Apai um, islands are located um, 40 miles south of Tonga's main island in the South Pacific. Um, they are originally two separate islands that fused as a result of volcanic activity um, in about 2015. And over time, um, there has been seismic and volcanic activity. Um, and what's really notice what's noticeable and very important about this specific um, location is that this is an underwater volcano. So in that diagram, you can kind of see how the elevation changes, but the center of it where the plume does come out of um, is underwater. And the eruption was strong enough to send um, well enough into, well, well enough volcanic um, its plume into the stratosphere and mesosphere. Um, and it kind of goes into like the volcanic plume itself. So chemically, its composition was mainly 
water, um, and when it was in the atmosphere, it was water vapor, and SO2, which is sulfur dioxide. Um, and what's really special about this eruption in particular is that it traveled about 55 kilometers into the atmosphere, which is about 34 miles, um, more, so, more than that. Um, it was about 146 teragrams of water, which is equivalent to over 146 billion kilograms. Um, and it, was, it had the strength of 15 megatons, which is about 15 million tons of TNT. So it was very, very strong. And you can kind of see the power. Um, this is over the course of about 24 hours. But it changes really quickly. And you can kind of just see the magnitude um, of that plume coming. Um, well, this is just a surface, but yeah. And um, this is kind of a cross section of the volcano as well as like the layers of the atmosphere. So in the research that I've been doing, um, the aim was to kind of showcase the evolution of the plume pollutants that I picked. So it was water vapor, sulfur dioxide, and sulfate, um, and kind of explore the ways that um, they can contribute to changes within our atmosphere um, as a result of the eruption. So I kind of used two um, levels of measure. Um, well, I usually, actually use three. So the first two are based on the hydropascals. Um, so 100 being close to um, the triple pause and the 50 being a little above that. And that's just to take into account the natural um, aerosol layers that are within these um, atmospheric layers. And um, as I show the plots and stuff, I'll be able to kind of explain and talk through that a little bit more too. Um, but you can kind of just see the magnitude of the plume and how much it travels up. Um, it says miles on the left side. And you can kind of see just how tall and how much that traveled up um, because of that great force. So with the data that I was using, we kind of had two main sets. And that's what we used to make our figures and kind of look at the evolution of these plume pollutants. So we had a volcano data set, which was the observed data from 2022 um, that took into account the eruption, as well as all of the um, concentration changes within the atmosphere. And then we had no volcano data, which was modeled using the CESM, or Community Earth System Model version 2, um, and WACM 6. Um, and that was specifically to stimulate or to simulate stratospheric um, water vapor and aerosol enhancements as a result of the eruption. Um, and what we did was we calculated the difference, and then we plotted that for our figures. So a lot of the data that I'm showing is volcano data minus no volcano data, so we can see the actual difference that happened within the atmosphere um, to see what has changed as a result um, for what is considered normal. Um, and I'm showing two different types of plots, um, global surface maps as well as vertical profiles. Um, the global surface maps kind of take into account a specific layer. Um, so that's going back to the 100 or 50 um, hydropascals. And the vertical profiles show the entire um, atmosphere um, in according and with all the layers as well. So starting off with water vapor. So this plot is um, the global surface. So this is at 100 HPA. Um, and you can kind of see over time how the water does kind of dissipate. Um, and this is just showing the overall trends. Um, there's a band that's pretty strong in between the 0 degrees and 30 degrees south for latitude that kind of starts out and it eventually disperses. Um, and this is a natural observation where you know, over time, some things will um, undergo other chemical processes, or they're just deposited back into um, more surface of the Earth. Um, and when we're looking at the vertical profiles, it's basically taking into account all the layers of the atmosphere. So you can see, instead of just at the 100 hydropascal um, mark, this is taking into account the entire atmosphere. So you can kind of see as well how it does disperse into different layers. Um, and it starts off pretty, really, pretty strong. And that centralized point does um, fall where the eruption did occur. And um, so this is actually also calculating the water global zonal average. So that's what these types of plots are called, just to take into account um, 
the entire zone. Now, on to our next plume pollutant, which was sulfur dioxide. Um, it definitely looks a little different. So what we had to do, because there are such drastic changes from month to month, um, with the concentration just going from a very concentrated amount to a very small amount, we had to change it into a log scale. So that's why the colors look a little different. Um, but starting out in the same ways, around the 0 to 30 degrees south, um, there is still that band that does um, start to disperse over time, um, similarly to the water. Um, and it's a trend that it's decreasing over time, um, similar to the, the water vapor. Um, and going to look at the, the pressure plot, so it's the same kind of way looking at the vertical profile. It starts off highly concentrated, and over time it does begin to disperse in different areas. Um, and what we did as well for the vertical profiles is it's in log scale for pressure, and that's as well to take into account um, the drastic changes in pressure within the atmospheric layers. So for our last plume pollutant, um, this is not one that was initially released from the volcano, but one that was, um, one that was I guess, formed um, as a result. So SO4 sulfate um, is formed by the oxidation of sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere does cause like net cooling effect on the planet. Um, there's some additional information. We can go over that later if need be. Um, so for sulfate, um, you can see how this band is a little different because its peak seems to increase from January to June, with June being its almost most highlighted month, um, and then decreases over time. And that's to take into account um, the formation as a result of the previous pollutants um, kind of interacting within um, this specific layer of the atmosphere. Um, and also for the pressure plots, you can kind of see as well how it's very highly concentrated. And over time, similarly to other um, figures, does disperse over time. So overall, the impacts on atmospheric, um, on the atmosphere in general. Um, so the main observation is that the increase of water vapor and sulfur dioxide um, after the eruption is very noticeable in all the areas that are not a dark shade of blue. That is an increase that we have observed. Um, and because of the injection of water vapor and sulfur dioxide, um, in the stratosphere, it does reduce the amount of ozone present. So in this figure over here, this is looking at ozone within the atmosphere. Um, and you can kind of see that this plot is different because this is tracking the loss of ozone within the atmosphere. Um, and those highlighted parts do show where there is more, there's less concentration that was taken out. Um, and ozone depletion um, was mainly in mid-latitudes in Austrial winter. So in particular, these plots were um, August, September, and October to take into account the seasonal difference between um, the northern and southern hemisphere. Um, and the pollutants in general contributed to additional chemical formation. That is something that we're looking to, hoping to look into as well. Um, but going back to the figure in the left corner, uh, where it's kind of dispersing to, that's like showing an indication of the Arctic, Arctic Circle ozone hole um, being strengthened. And like the most important thing is like what can we do from here? Um, and one thing I'm very interested in kind of pursuing and continuing to look at is specifically sulfuric acid. So sulfuric acid does have its concentrations within the atmosphere, but um, when we were making some plots, just preliminary figures, um, there was a lot going on, and we weren't able to refine it too well. Um, but sulfuric acid does contribute to acid rain. Um, and I think it'd be very important to kind of do um, more research on understanding how that affects um, you know, vegetation and water quality, um, just because that is so prevalent and will continue to worsen over time. Um, and then also just understanding the impact of both biological and anthropogenic forms of 
um, pollutants in our atmosphere and kind of how they interact together. Um, because this was my first time working with um, data that, or data and um, I guess looking at pollutants that were non-human caused, um, which has been a really interesting way to kind of um, get a better idea of like natural um, pollutant causing um, situations like the volcanic eruption, but just kind of see their relationship with each other because as we continue to put more, more toxins into the air, um, just seeing how that disrupts these chemical processes as well within the atmosphere. And for acknowledgments, thank you to the NSF for funding everything and NCAR UCAR for all the labs, greatly appreciated. Um, to my mentor who has been amazing and really just facilitated and worked with me to you know, learn so much about atmospheric chemistry and welcomed me into the lab, which has been amazing. And then the entire NESI program, um, Jerry, Ben, Aaliyah, and all the interns, um, I really appreciate it. Citation. Yeah. Okay, do we have some questions from the audience? Utah. Hey, Daniel, great presentation, thank you. I'm only vaguely familiar with uh, atmospheric chemistry terminology, so if you could just explain a little bit what CO2 pressure means exactly and what's we're, what we're seeing on the plot also. Yeah, great question. Okay. So I can go back to... So yeah, we'll look at this one. So are you talking about the pressure in particular? So yeah, so because these vertical profile plots are, um, they basically showcase these plots, um, but instead of showing the latitude and longitude, um, it changes the longitude into pressure. So the importance of that is just to showcase not just a specific layer of the atmosphere um, that these ones we're kind of focusing on, um, but showing the whole um, atmosphere composition because um, at a certain surface, you can only see so much that's going on. It's a, it's a flat plane. So by being able to look at the vertical profile, um, it just takes into account all the changes within the atmosphere. And pressure in particular changes, um, it decreases as you go up in the atmosphere. So that just takes into account um, that as well. So at the bottom, that's more um, surface area. And as it goes up, it's higher in the atmosphere. Thank you. It's a really interesting talk. I'm just wondering for those changes after the eruption, how long those changes are going to exist? And like for the negative effects such as ozone depletion, is it happen instantly because of a high concentration or because the duration they stayed in the atmosphere? Yeah. So to answer your first question, um, a lot of these, so the insertion of these pollutants into the atmosphere are something is something that we will have to continue observing over the next couple years. Um, I was just informed about a paper that came out, I believe, last week um, that was talking about how it just contributes to so much um, warming over the next five years that they're already kind of modeling out. Um, because of the ozone depletion in particular, um, that's something that will have to be monitored as well because of so much water vapor being inserted into the, um, into the stratosphere. So it's something that will definitely continue to be observed and researched into. Um, and as long as no other eruptions or we're not sending as much pollutants into the atmosphere, it's hard to predict. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question is regarding the changes happening here. Um, I see most changes are only in the southern hemisphere, not in the northern hemisphere. Is there some explanation behind that? Um, so specifically, just to clarify, so why it's in the southern hemisphere? So the changes are more in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. So I see the yellow blob shifting more towards these yeah. negative latitudes compared to the positive latitudes. Yeah, so um, because, OK, just sorry, I'm just trying to, let me tell me if this is the question you were asking. So because of its location with its latitude, like why is it specifically concentrated there? Or, or is it, uh, why is it spreading more towards the southern hemisphere? And we see less changes in the northern hemisphere. Yes. Uh, yeah. 
Is there a reason behind that? So yeah, so the eruption did take place in the southern hemisphere. Okay. So that's why a lot of the formation of, um, or that's why there's highly concentrated areas closer on that area. Um, but as it does disperse, you know, it does kind of cross into different layers and different um, latitudes. So that's why you kind of see that spreading out. So usually it's localized to the hemisphere in which that activity occurs. Yes, and it's very dependent on how far um, the pollutants have been, um, I guess, dispersed into specific layers of the atmosphere um, because there are already pre-existing um, chemicals and compounds that kind of interact and change the concentrations over time. Thank you. Um, first off, great talk. Uh, I really love all the plots. Uh, could you go back to your um, uh, water vapor plot um, that shows the distri distribution across the entire planet? There you go. Yeah. So this is, just so if I understand correctly, this is um, what was added on, okay. Um, so yeah, it's pretty interesting that we see um, a, a higher amount of uh, water vapor um, in the southern hemisphere during its um, transition season and then into its winter. And then into our winter in the northern hemisphere, we see an increase, um, which is kind of the opposite of what you would expect with like the, um, the uh, 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 movement of the ITCZ. Um, is, so is that um, something that you guys looked at or? That's a great question. So that's something we have not explicitly looked into. I think that would be interesting to see, especially with the seasonal variation and how that causes um, a lot of just changes because you're right, it does go, um, it does go travel up the latitude sometimes um, for specific months. So I think that'd be interesting looking into, um, but at this time we have not. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, could you go back to your SO4 slide? Also the lead long plot. That one or the vertical profile? No, this one. This one? Sorry. There we go. Uh, I think in, it looks like in January the highest concentration is like between South America and Australia. Like why is it there and not like over the place of the eruption? Yeah, so um, we can, I know there's a little picture. Go back. Okay, so um, its location, its proximity to Australia is fairly close in the scheme of, you know, how vast the Earth is. But um, what we, I guess what I was assuming uh, was because of the natural winds and um, a lot of these a lot of the pollutants kind of take those band-like positions as they um, travel across um, the globe. Um, that's, yeah, that's Makes what sense. I was just Thanks. assuming. Great work, Daniel, thank you.